In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk all about training to failure and why you probably shouldn't do it. He needs some milk. Sal also talks about why he's cutting caffeine and how he's doing it. I'm drinking the shit out of the red juice. We also get into, hey, why are Mind Pump sponsored programs or products so expensive? It's all about quality, people. And finally, we had four questions that we took from our Instagram account. One question was about training for VO2 max versus training for cardiovascular health. Another question was about when did you guys decide to go all in on Mind Pump? This company into the f stratosphere! Well, if you don't want to listen to the entire episode and you need just short highlights from the show, go to Mind Pump Clips and subscribe there on our other YouTube channel, and you can get everything broken down into digestible pieces. All right, here comes the show. Enjoy. Lifting to failure can produce accelerated muscle growth. However, there's some very interesting caveats. Don't listen to the caveats, and you will burn yourself out. All right, so I want to talk so about- there's a place for this. There is. I want to talk about it because it's constantly brought up, constantly about lifting to failure. I saw the study, I did this thing. Mm -hmm. They talk about, you know, you gotta go real hard, real intense and whatever. And so I wanted to talk about lifting to failure and its potential benefit and why for most people it's just too much intensity most of the time, but used at the right times, it could produce some pretty pretty interesting results, pretty interesting results. Obviously there's some prerequisites that you gotta consider yeah. before we get into this kind of intensity. Yeah, well, I'm gonna define failure first. So I'm not talking about literally failing in a lift. Like you're working out and you can't move it anymore and you fall down or you drop the weight. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. I talk about form failure. So what I'm referring to is you you cannot possibly lift the weight for another good form rep. So you stop. That means you failed, okay? Not that you can't lift it at all anymore. That's not the kind of failure I'm talking about. So I'm talking about technical failure, I think some people refer to. Mm. So that's number one, because if you train to crappy form failure, you end up training poor recruitment patterns, you dramatically increase your risk of injury. And then it really just becomes about how much weight you can add to the bar, how many more reps you can squeeze out, how much more you can move. And you really start to uh, increase the risk versus reward ratio or change the risk versus reward ratio so that the risk starts making the reward just not worth it. The second thing is you have to account for volume. A failure set is worth like four or five traditional sets in terms of how it affects your central nervous system and your body. So if you're traditionally doing a chest workout with nine sets and you decide you're going to go to failure in that workout, I would say cut it down from nine sets to three sets, something along those lines. Now, this is going to be different from person to person, but you, you should definitely equate uh, for, uh, volume for intensity. And then the, the last caveat I'll say is failure tends to work with higher reps better than it does with lower reps. Lower rep failure just doesn't have the right amount of volume uh, for a lot of exercises to really give you the benefit. So like if I go to failure for five reps on an exercise, I, you just tend to not get as great results as if you go to failure with 10 to 12 or even 15 reps because you still want volume, right? You still want volume, but that intensity is there. And studies show that higher reps can be very effective so long as intensity is very high. So, mm. so this is an interesting conversation right now because I'm doing this, you know, these kind of 20, 30 minute workouts I've been now consistently doing it for like a month and a half. One of the things that I'm doing different also is I'm really challenging myself to pretty much never go to failure. Um, and what I'm noticing with myself is uh, I'm not, uh, this is the, this is the longest I've been consistent in the last, I don't know, say five, six years of training with uh, as far and frequency almost every day at least uh, four to five times a week and not battling uh, joint issues. Yeah. Yep. And, and on top of that, uh, when I started this program, my thought process was, you know, I really just want to stay strong. I don't want to lose any of the muscle I currently have and I'll tighten the diet up, hopefully kind of lean out uh, slowly over time in no hurry that way. But it was, Really, I, I wasn't looking at the, this training program. I'm going to pack on all this muscle. Yeah. But what I'm finding is I'm building muscle. Yeah. And and I'm getting stronger. And that, that really wasn't the intent. I mean, it, it, obviously, whenever we're training, it kind of always is. But I really wasn't pushing the intensity. I wasn't really trying to scale up. Um, but I'm finding my body really uh, – and, 
why this is interesting to me is because I, I tend to keep learning this lesson over and over for myself. I mean, we've been touting on this podcast for over five years about not training to failure. Mm -hmm. Yet I still, I still love to test that. I still like to mm -hmm. see where my kind of where, where my max is. I still like to throw in a couple sets here or there and a workout every now and then where I go to failure. And I'm really challenging myself not to really at all. And I'm feeling the best I've ever felt and I'm seeing great results. And so I really think that failure training is grossly overrated. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I feel like I adopted uh, for most of my training career. And it's to the point that it's difficult to completely wean it off. You yeah. Know? I, you know, I'm going to speak to that for a second because um, I agree with you. I think most people should live for the most part in their training where they don't train to failure. Now there's intensity. So you're still training intensely, mm -hmm. but you're not training to failure. I do think most people should live there. Now the challenge is when people flirt with going to failure and they do it for the first time or they do it in the first week or so, you do see rapid strength gains, right? You do see like a big gain. So, you know, if you train, you know, smart and consistent and intelligent, you don't go to failure. And then you're like, okay, I read this article. I'm going to test it out. You're going to see strength gains right away. They go away quickly though, right? What I mean is you hit a plateau very fast because that button, once you use it, like you can't just keep using it. So there's a smart way to do it. And the way that I use it, the way that I use it and the way that I'm really seeing that it works well is I'll do it a couple times, uh, three times a month, yeah. you know, like three, four times a month max where depending on the workout, depending on the time frame that I can train uh, and the exercise, I may do it and cut all the volume out. So my workout's only going to be five exercise or four exercises, but each one is a set to failure and then I'm done with the whole workout type of deal. Um, of, of course, once I'm warmed up and stuff and I don't do it again and again and again, I'll do it once and then I'll kind of back off. That's why I don't like to communicate this because most people don't know how to intelligently put it in a program. Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Anabolic, the program that's all the most popular MAPS program, great for muscle and strength and speeding up the metabolism. You can get it for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Click on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won that program for free. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The Skinny Guy Bundle, which includes all of these incredible programs, is 50% off. And the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes all these other great programs, is also 50% off. So if you want to get the 50% off discount, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Well, I think there's multiple ways to kind of stretch your capacity, which is really what um, I mean, this whole training process, like you have to figure out where the, where the line is to begin with. And so um, it really depends on who I'm talking to. I think the general audience of who we're speaking to the most, like what Adam's bringing up makes the most sense. Like it's, there's really not a whole lot of need for you to go yeah. to that level of intensity. Um, there's other variables we can manipulate and we can focus on um, to be able to get you a new kind of a stimulus. So your muscle does respond and, you know, maybe we up the volume, maybe we, um, you know, hold in the tempo position, we, we, we up the isometrics so you can like really produce and generate force, but it's not as damaging as say, now I'm overloading my body, uh, to that degree. Uh, but also like for me, from a performance per perspective and angle, if I'm dealing with somebody that's somewhat young and resilient and is in an athletic, you know, performance driven path. Um, you know, this is something that I would, you know, program and schedule this up to a pinnacle, to a peak of like here, we've put in all this work uh, for base strength. And, and now we need to, we need to test our threshold and our capacity to be able to see, you know, how resilient, how strong we actually are uh, in, in this environment. Yeah. You bring up a good point. So one thing that I noticed when I mess with this is I actually, um, it sets the, the gauge or for where I can predict failure is the next workout. So what I mean by that is, you know, if I haven't trained to failure in a long time and I go for a long time without ever training to failure, uh, just because like, like, we, like we're saying, the risk versus reward ratio isn't very good. And, and when you use it too often, it just doesn't work. In fact, you tend to go backwards. But I'll do barbell squats and I'll be like, okay, I haven't gone to failure on a set of squats for, you know, six months. So let me try going to failure. 
And as I'm going through the set, I'll always be like, oh my God, this is going to be the last rep. And then I'll do another rep. Like, oh no, I think this is going to be the last you rep. You surprise yourself. I surprise too. myself because I start to lose uh, kind of the feel for where that end is. So stopping two reps short of failure changes after that because then I start to develop a new gauge, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing too is when I do it, and I do it very short for, again, I, I'm messing with it, but I do it for a very short period. So uh, like if I haven't trained for, for, to failure for three weeks, I'll take my workouts for a week, cut the volume by a third, and I'll go to failure. And I'll come back the next workout and I'm stronger. Mm -hmm. and, but I don't keep hammering it, right? I don't keep hammering it. And, and really what you want to consider with programming, there's a lot of factors that go into programming, but the three <clears throat> big ones are like frequency, how often you train a body part or how often you train your body, volume, that's total reps, total weight, you know, so it's weight times reps, I think, times sets, right? Um, so volume, frequency, and intensity. And sometimes what you could do is you can go extreme on one of them, but you got to, you got to take away from the other ones. So I can't just dramatically increase the frequency without reducing the volume and also adjusting the intensity. Mm -hmm. I can't just dramatically increase the intensity without reducing frequency and, or, uh, in, uh with your volume, right? You got to look at all that and it's, it's okay. Especially once you're kind of like, you know how to train your body, you've been working out for a while. It's okay to go extreme with one of them to take away from the other ones just to see how that novelty affects your body. And oftentimes you start to learn some new things about your body and how your body responds and how well you do. And I will say this, there are individual variances. Now we speak very generally because we're trying to hit most people, but I I know people who do very well with high intensity, very low volume, low frequent workouts. That's not the, that's not the rule. It's the exception, but I know people. Then I know people that really, really do well with high, high, high frequency type workouts with very low intensity. Um, and you know, there's one with volume too. So it's great to learn this about yourself and to manipulate and play with it a little bit, but I would never recommend failure to anybody who doesn't have a lot of experience and know what they're doing. That's the last thing right. I do with a client when I train a client is well, say, Hey, we're gonna take a set to failure. I think there's, I think there's a genetic component. And then I also think there's a, what season of your life you're in too. Like, I think part of why maybe I feel the way I do now is I'm just, I mean, I'm 40 years old. I have a kid. Yeah. <laughs> we have a very important job that I'm doing pretty much around the clock. Like there's, I have different stressors that I probably didn't have when I was 25 years old. So maybe my body could handle mm -hmm. that at, at, a, at a, like the, that type of training at a higher frequency. So I think there's more than one, uh, one thing at play here that other than just like certain people can handle that. It's like, okay, certain people can. Yeah, context, can. life context. Yeah, life context has to matter too. Yeah. Like you, maybe at this point in your life, maybe you think, because here's the thing, I thought I was that person. And because I identified as that person, because I was probably in my teens and 20s, uh, it took me a while to accept that I'm not anymore. In fact, I yeah. would I would say, I would argue that intensity is the one that you have to take away from the most as you age. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the next one would be volume and then it would be frequency. So as you get older, you got to drop the intensity. So you're not going to see a 70 year old or a 65 year old going to failure as often as you see a 25 year old, but they might be able to keep up volume and frequency a little bit, but then volume is going to drop and then eventually frequency is going to drop. Like for example, Jack LaLanne, who is widely regarded as the godfather of the fitness industry, one of the most fit men of all time, set world records in pushups and pull-ups at 50, um, and at 70 did some crazy stuff. But anyway, in his, in his 90s and 80s and 90s, he was working out for 30 minutes a day, I think. Yeah. Right? So way less Every volume, yeah. way less intensity he did when he was in his 20s and uh, his 30s. So that makes a lot of sense, um, you know, what you're saying there, Adam. So I want, I want to address something else you said, because I've heard you say it before, and... Um, I don't know if you mean it for all exercises or just a couple in particular, because I've only experienced it with two exercises. And you were talking about how using training to failure to get a good gauge on yeah. what you should set. I only find this useful for me for squats and deadlifts. Every other exercise, I can tell doing it like how much I got. You know what I mean? Like there's been times when I've been squatting and I think I don't have any more and I squeeze three, four more out. Yeah, no. Same I thing with deadlifting. But Overhead press, bench press, bicep curls, tricep push downs. I would I mean, say the more complex the lift, the yeah. more overall fatigue and challenge it is, the more likely you are to overestimate when failure is coming. So I would agree with that because squats is the one that I'm always way off. I'm yeah. always like, wow, I did five more than I thought. Yes. Yeah, curls, I know right away. Like, yeah, right is, away. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's like, I don't need any, I don't need yeah, any of the single joint lifts. Yeah. It's like, come on. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even feel that way with overhead press. Overhead press, I, I'm like, no, oh, that's all I got. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can tell by the way the last rep went up, like there's definitely not another one or else I'm really going to compromise yeah. the movement. Yeah. Um, it's deadlifting and squatting are the only two I really... You, I, I, 100%. And yeah. I will say this too. You So sometimes you may think this is going to cut down on the time of your workout because like, okay, instead of doing you know, 20 sets, I'm only going to do seven sets today because those are the failure ones and I'm cutting the volume down. Here's what ends up happening, especially if you're strong and you're advanced. Those seven sets will take as long as 20 sets because it takes a lot out of you. Now, maybe not single joint failure, but you go to failure on compound lifts, you're resting for like six minutes. Yeah. I mean, you guys saw me today even. I was trying to do it and I'm just sitting on the bench, you know, most of the time because it's exhausting to go that hard, you know? So I would not take it lightly if you're going to mess around with this a little bit. But if you're advanced, you've got good control and you can honestly stop when you have technical failure because it's very tempting to do another set or sorry, another rep when your form is already starting to break down. It's very tempting to try and beat your previous record by three you reps. Have two disciplines, two. right? You got to have the discipline to be able to ramp up to that degree to even be able to handle it. Then yep. you got to have the discipline to know when to back off and, and okay, that's it. I'm done. Yep. I think we get a little bit of pushback on this conversation because there's obviously research to support the benefits of training to uh, failure when it comes to building muscle. But my opinion is that it's uh, even in this it contradicts probably what the, the research says. And that's that I, I just don't think it's that valuable for most people. Mm -hmm. I, just, I really don't. I think that considering that we, we understand that the research supports its benefits to building muscle, there's far, there's far more factors that you should be trying to play with and manipulate and get better at that are going to serve you way more in pursuit of building more muscle than training to failure. And I feel like the training to failure is such an easy add to your, it's like you could just go until you can't do. Good yeah. Thing. Like that's such a, that's such a small, small minded way of approaching, trying to build muscle. In my opinion, there's so many other things in your programming and training and diet that you, sh you should tweak that are going to benefit you a lot more than, than yeah. that. To be fair though, Adam, there's lots of evidence now in research to show that it's not something that contributes to better results. So there's, there's studies that'll compare it going to failure, not going to failure. And they'll say, they'll find that it's actually not beneficial. Some say it may be beneficial. Some say it may, it may actually be detrimental. Um, I don't think it's, uh, the, this great panacea. I mean, when I started working out, there was a lot of uh, debate around this because in the seventies, everybody, you know, Arnold was Mr. Olympia. That's where strength training or I should I say bodybuilding advice came from. And he was a high volume guy, 20 sets per body part, double split routine. So it'd work out twice a day, every body part getting hit all the time. So super high volume in the 80s. It was also high volume, but you started to see it drop off. During this time, Mike Menser comes out with something called heavy duty, which is like only do one set to failure and that's it. And some people got great results with that. With that. But that kind of stayed in the fringes. Then you had Dorian Nates who came out in the 90s, this mass monster who crushed everybody. And he was an advocate of Mike Menser. So he did what's called blood and guts, a little bit more volume than heavy duty. He named his blood and guts, but it was still high intensity, max out set, way less volume. Well, because he's Mr. Olympia, everything started going in that direction. Now we see that it's volume, frequency, and intensity. They're all very important. They can all be overdone. And uh, again, the studies can go in either way. I'm just saying, look, this is a potential tool. Yeah. And if you are if you have good technique, good form, if you've got experience, you can definitely play with a little bit and see what happens. And, and you will see some short-term, especially because it's novel, You'll see some short-term boosts and gains from it. But like to your seasons of life thing, I mean, I saw this with like high school kids. It's like they don't they don't even understand um, how much effort that they can really push and provide. <laughs> yeah. Like you can work so much harder, mm. um, and that's a that's a discipline and a mental shift that needs to happen first. Um, so you know where do you where do you kind of toe that line in terms of value? Well. Um, I definitely see that in terms of your your overall knowledge and self awareness of like um, what you can actually produce while you're in the gym. And now we got to kind of gauge that and, and be yeah. be more studious. What about we it. need to stop doing is listening to the top bodybuilders and top strength yeah. athletes. First off, these people do not represent the average person. In fact, if you're watching this or listening to this, you have nothing in common with them. I'll tell you right now, <laughs> they're they are 
anomalies on the genetic spectrum. No it's different so than, hard, though, when you're talking to like it's someone who wants to be them, though. You know you're you're not. You can't it's change like, your genetics. Look, I, could, like, I could try to be I want to be a bodybuilder, so I'm going to listen to yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? I want to be a power lifter, so I'm going to listen to it. Look, him. I could try to be seven feet tall as much as I want. Ain't going to happen. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. You can work with what you got, but it ain't going to happen. What we should be taking advice from is are the trainers and coaches that train lots of everyday people that train. <clears throat> For example, Bet Contreras did a, the post about here's what you should do to build muscle. And this was what really works. And I'm looking at, and Brett Contreras has, has trained a lot of people over time. Lots and lots and He's lots and lots of people. works. Yeah. And I read his stuff. And I'm like, this looks like a maps program. Like he put together all the points. <laughs> Why? Because he trains a lot of people. He comes yeah. to the same conclusions. Yeah. You know, it. like all of us, I didn't work with you guys until we started mind pump. We sat down, started trading notes and they're all the same. Yeah. We all came to the same conclusion. So dude, speaking of the post and other people in our peers and stuff like that, did you see uh Ben Pollock response to um lift run bang guy ball Paul Carter's uh Oh, comparing machines to like free. Yeah, so I, I mean poor Ben Pollock gets the same BS that we get, you know, when we talk about barbell squatting and stuff like yeah. that, that everybody references the, that Paul Paul Carter guy or whatever. Uh and I thought Ben Pollock did a good job of kind of explaining uh, he basically said i like barbell squatting because it's harder than the other lifts and because it's harder i learn how to i i, I perceive effort and challenge differently so then when i go to the machines i can put forth more intensity into the exercise mm. and i agree with that okay. point i, I don't do think I, there, I think there's more to it but I, I agree with that point i love that i love that point and the reason why i'm bringing it up is because what justin's talking about right now it's like you talk about the, the importance of learning how to train intense yeah. intensely yeah. how important that is one of the one another another great benefit of barbell back squatting and deadlifting is it's the hardest thing you're gonna do in the gym it is it is literally like one of the hardest movements that you're gonna and getting good at that then carries over into the all yeah all go do a moves. machine row after you do barbell deadlift it's gonna feel a lot easier right than right deadlift yeah no i thought that was a really interesting yeah. uh interesting like point that yeah. uh that ben pollock brought up all right anyway i want to tell you guys about let's talk about the weekend a little bit because i didn't get to see you guys so this weekend uh my daughter's school did their annual carnival festival things so, you know they have like the ride set up Oh, and yeah. Games and all that stuff. Okay. So I took. Which uh, you're excellent at. Well, yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> carnival game. That's guy. Okay. For people that don't know this, like uh, Sal has a million. How many nicknames. stuffed animals have you won in your yeah, life? Dude? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's so just start with you're that. only saying that. Carnival <laughs> Sal is like one of his <laughs> nicknames. Okay. For people who don't understand, there's, like there's sports. I got one for you guys. There's three things that happened that this is why this happened. This is why they say that. <laughs> one, years ago, I was across our gym. I was like way on the other side, and we had this tiny little basketball hoop. On top of one of those, the ones that you throw your garbage in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had a ball in my hand that literally barely fits in the hoop. I'm way across there. And I go, I'm going to make it. And Adam says, yeah, right. If you make that, I'll buy you a car. <laughs> and I threw it and it made it you right made inside. It, <laughs> Legit. So that's one. Two, we all went to a gym in Vegas once yeah. and played horse. It's yeah. not really basketball, but still with a basketball. <laughs> yeah. And I beat them both. And they're both objectively. It's basically like the boardwalk where you there have was like another, a and you guys are way better. There was another stupid. Top golf. Oh, that's right. Top golf. Right. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, he just like, like consistently hitting those points, but literally <laughs> dragged it across and it just rolled yeah. in. Like, so like you're good at scoring points. Yeah. Well, anyway, I took, so I went to this festival and I brought uh, the baby, right? So he's, he's not even two yet. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to play these carnival games with them. What a mistake. What a mistake. <laughs> we go to one and there's these ducks that are floating around, these plat, these rubber ducks, and yeah. you got to throw a ring over their head or whatever. Yeah, yeah. He don't give a shit about the game. He wants to jump in the water with the ducks. <laughs> Hang out with the ducks. Bro, he's trying to climb the wall. He's screaming. <laughs> oh I want to play with the duck. I want to grab it. You don't care about what I'm trying to do. Oh my God. Then I did another one where I, I hit this hammer on this little thing and it flips a frog into these, I don't know what they are, tat, like uh, yeah, whatever they are. Lily yeah. pads. Or lily pads, yeah. He don't care, bro. He's crying because he wants to hold the hammer. He wants to play with the the rubber thing that flies in there. He's screaming. <laughs> so half the time, I'm dragging my screaming kid away from these games. And Jessica's like, I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> like, I thought we'd have fun. He don't care. I, w I want to win him something. He doesn't care about the prizes. He wants to jump in there with the with the games. How about his uh, his new haircut? Oh. <laughs> So yeah, that, bro, like, he, looks like, he looks like he looks like Mo from the Three Stooges. <laughs> uh, you know Mo from the Three Stooges. I think yeah, it's, it's like, like a bowl cut. It's like a good solid around. year you have to deal with, like, and you're you're entering it right now. So, I, and I'm sure you remember this arc, right? It starts off like, oh wow, he does really good getting his hair cut. 
because he's like, yeah, right, yeah. Just, and then they, then it, then, it, then all of a sudden he gets ah, yeah. fussy. <laughs> well, Jessica was in a hurry, and there's this haircut place, and so she was grocery shopping. So I'm gonna go in there and just do this real quick. And they have like those chairs that look like spaceships and stuff. He was screaming the whole time, and the lady sucked. Yeah, bro, she messed. It's like this, dude. He looks like uh, the Queen's Gambit. What's her name? Um, uh, oh, the yeah. chess movie or whatever with mm -hmm. the high bangs. Right across here. <laughs> in the back. I don't know what she thought. One you side is in tail. more than the other side. She's like, I can fix it. Jessica's like, no, we're done. And she leaves. <laughs> so I'm like, damn, poor kid. Oh, he's too young, though. He's in, he's in notice. So right now we're putting hats on him. <laughs> <laughs> Will he keep the hat on? Yeah. No, at least he'll keep the hat on. Yeah. We're just wearing hats now. We, <laughs> uh, we started uh, potty training. Oh, how's that going? Oh, that's right. So I, um, so on this podcast, I have shared uh, dad hacks and things that um, I think we've we've implemented or done well with our son and stuff like that. I think it's only fair that I offer up the things that I think we didn't do well. Um, and this is this. There's only been two big things so far at highlights that I, I don't think we did very well, and and we and I now feel the backfire later on. The first one, and I think I brought it up a long time ago, was we we hand fed max forever. Oh yeah. Right. Which you, for speech development, um, that's not, and a lot of that was, you know, Katrina and I are, are pretty neat people. We didn't want to have to clean up a mess like crazy. Yeah. And so it was like, we'll just keep feeding him. Are until you guys ever worried he's going to choke? Is that also why? Or that not? yes. Katrina's yeah. like super, she's more so that, I mean, I am too. Like, uh, of course I'm worried that mm -hmm. my son. So like, by the he, way, you could buy these little, I know. Uh, oh, do you have them? I didn't order it, but I've seen it. And the only reason why I didn't was because, my wife is it will not let my son chew on something that he can choke on. Like he, she cuts everything <laughs> okay. into like drinking size. You know <laughs> okay. like, like he could drink a steak. I'm like, okay. Those are so small, right? Jessica gives gives Aurelius a freaking lamb chop. So that I'm more like, and I'm that. in the corner I'm sweating. Like, like I like, choke. I like hand. I like, I'll hand him like the full chicken leg or something yeah. like that. And she's like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? And then she'll peel it apart or whatever. So. That was the first one because here we are. He's finally at you know three three years plus, starting to somewhat feed himself, and and it feels like we have a you know a one year old trying to feed himself. So that was uh, one of the things I think we could have done better. The second one that is is now the potty training. I didn't realize this, and I take responsibility for this one because Katrina had brought it up several times. I'm like ah, just we haven't had three days in a row when we're home, and I just kept blowing it off, blowing it off, blowing it off. We'll get around to it. We'll get around to it. Um, and my thought process was he, because he was kind of delayed in speech and he wasn't communicating very well yet. I'm like, I don't want to like get into the potty training stuff. He, I can't communicate very well with them stuff sure. while well, reading the, reading the books on it. Um, I was wrong. In fact, they say, as soon as you can tell your kid to like throw something in the trash and they understand, they don't have to be able to speak or say anything. They just understand how to take something and go put it somewhere. They're ready. And you should start then. So as early as like one to definitely by two. And as you, as time goes on, the longer you wait, the more difficult the this, gets, yeah. this phase is for us right now. Sure. So here we are at three. And for most people, the like the, the three day knock it out thing is really successful. And then they're good to go where it says like, it should take us probably a week or longer because we waited till three years old. So it's been, Damn, you gotta do like a whole yeah, vacation, yeah, yeah. bro. It's been, yeah. Katrina's like full court press run. And let me tell you, it's like, um, it's all hands on deck. Oh bro. my God. I mean, and all I, all I could do to support, I felt like was everything else in the house. Right. So I just, I took care of the rest of the house while she is like manning him 24 seven. So and, and it's, and it's a alarm goes off yeah. every 15, I think 10 or 15 and minutes. You sit him on the toilet. Yes. So my, all so, day. So my mom loves to talk about how she got us all potty, potty trained. I think it was a year. Uh, or let, under a year and a half. And she said what she would do is she would sit me on the little potty and she'd just sit me there and just talk and read, hang out with me or whatever. And then I'd use the bat and I'd pee and she'd make a big deal about it. So mm. I'm like, you did that all day? She's like, oh yeah, when I would potty train you, I would literally sit you on there yeah. and you would just hang out Camp there out. Yeah. all day long. I'm like, oh my god, The discipline to do that. I'm watching Katrina right now and like I just have so much empathy for her. You just put newspaper all over the house. Well, she's, what she did was she, so we have, when like you come in our house in, in the entryway, we have a pretty big entryway back where that, that massive tree was at, right? It's all tile. So she's like kind of, you know, quarantined him to that little area and brought all his toys. And, and, mm. and then I think it also tells you to keep him active doing things like, so she's like, day one is nothing on. So he's naked, right? 
I came I came home naked and hung around all day with him. I thought I'd make him feel comfortable. So we were. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I it was a naked like, party. What the fuck are you doing? Just walking around the house like that. <laughs> just no pants. I had a shirt on. Watch your daddy do it. Yeah. You overflow that little. Toilet. Yeah, I said, I want my son to feel comfortable. You know what I'm saying? So, so <laughs> what a great uh, idea. Yeah, yeah. Although, yeah. although maybe it made him uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, the fuck, yeah, man? Yeah, yeah. Put your pants yeah, yeah. on. So, <laughs> just so, a shirt man. on. What are you, so, yeah. what are you, what are you Donald Duck? No, no it's Winnie, the Pooh. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, bro. That's Winnie the Pooh. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. So or the planner I, guy. I, yeah. Day one is no, 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 no pants, no diaper, no underwear, no nothing. Uh, day two, it, they say is like a regression is uh, underwear on, and he's gonna make some mistakes, and so you go through like twelve yeah. pieces, twelve things of underwear, or whatever. Yeah. And then the third day is underwear on all day, and then you go try and have like a normal routine of like you're not just every mm -hmm. ten minutes you're just asking him to get him to do it. But I definitely. It was, it was, these three days have been tough. Katrina's still dealing with it now. She'll be dealing with it all week. And I'm like, damn, that's like been full court press. Like we weren't able to do anything else. I mean, you're not. Man. Yeah. So if you're a, if you're a new. I got to let Jessica know because she's, <clears throat> she's waiting. She, cause Aurelius shows signs. Like he'll, he'll, he'll go around the kitchen table. He's, there's a corner where he goes to the bathroom. Yeah. So he'll go back there. And, and it was the same way. He does this. Do it's that. the cutest thing. Same spot. He goes back there and he covers his eyes. <laughs> so he looks through it. Like here's, here, <laughs> so here's why it becomes really difficult. And that, so you're, and so maybe Jessica can learn from my mistake on that. Cause I thought the same thing i was like i was waiting for more signs of him really getting the whole yeah, like being ready yeah you know? being ready and we can communicate a little bit which was like not the way thinking what you're trying to do is catch them before they actually start having potty behaviors where they go behind and they squat because then it becomes a routine now uh, it becomes way more it. difficult because now you got to break that versus having as soon as they can you, you can command them to go throw something in the trash and they have the awareness yeah. to do that they are ready to know that this goes in the potty mm -hmm. and that you're supposed to do it then and it's much easier to transition the longer you wait and the the more behaviors they have mm -hmm. around going in there the harder it's going and that's what we're doing with you're like, gonna get you're gonna get so you go from diapers to potty to they use the toilet but then you're gonna go through a long phase of when they're in the bathroom, dad, yeah, you come dad, you gotta go wipe his butt. Yeah, that's yeah. always my favorite. Yeah, you know, you just had a party or something. So dad, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so many butts I had to wipe. Oh yeah, oh, I remember man. teaching my oldest. He was obviously he's the oldest, the first one. And I remember the first time I'm like, all right, it's your turn to, you know, I'm gonna try and teach him to wipe himself. Yeah, and he got the toilet paper and he just wiped his cheek. Like on the side right here. I'm like that's not that's not where it happens, dude. Bro. You guys go in the middle, bro. <laughs> Ever used to use a whole toilet roll. I'm like, whose kid is this, right? You know, just yeah. <laughs> and he'd like plug the toilet because he just use the whole freaking so thing, kid. dude. That it's is, like everywhere. That is just it's I'm like, bro, you only need dude, a little bit. It's I mean, I'm you guys are so so much further ahead than I am, right? As far as like your kids really taking on your traits and stuff like that. And it was Sal's son, dude, is so has Sal's dark sense of humor. Oh, yeah. I heard about that. Oh my God, I died. Yeah. I was working out the other day and he made some comment to me and I just fell, fell you off. You can say what he said. Just, so. it's, bad. it's dark humor. So yeah. keep in mind, he knows this audience. Yeah, so. yeah. No, he definitely Because I confronted him about him. Like, Did I, you say this? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, damn, It bro. actually took a second to register. I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in our gym, right? I'm working out uh, and he's, he was at the front office. I actually didn't even know he was here at the time. And uh, I've got the I've got my music blaring, and I've just been on a random Lincoln Park kick again. So I'm playing like old Lincoln <laughs> so Park music, crawling right? Crawling in my yeah, skin. It's, yeah, it's, I think it was even that song, right? Yeah, so just and, angst. I'm, and yeah, I, yeah super angst. angsty. And I'm I'm getting ready to lift and so that I'm like so focused, my head I'm looking straight ahead, and he comes over and he says something to me. I go, huh? And he goes, is this you? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, you gonna go shoot up a school later? <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. What did you just say, <laughs> wow. bro? What did you just say wow. right now? It was like, wow. I was like, oh my God. So dude, emo. You are so, your freaking father's son to say dude, some shit that I, dark. Uh, you yeah, know my daughter's worse? Dark. Is she really? Worse. I can't imagine her Bro, she makes, she'll make a joke and I'm like, wow. Yeah. And I appreciate it because I appreciate that, that sense so of humor. It's so interesting. Yeah. But I had to have a conversation with him and I- She's, I don't know if I have to, did I say it to her? I think I talked to her about this too, but to him for sure about knowing his audience. Yeah. She's so like, I know you make those jokes. I said, just make sure it's okay with the person you talk to. Cause some people don't take that the right yeah. way. I wonder if there's like a 50, 50 split nowadays because it's so taboo. Uh, everybody's feelings get so hurt so easily. Right. But then there's other kids that aren't. 
And they're the ones that are just like, this is ridiculous. You, like the younger the, generations is darker. I cause because my kids like friends are like real dark humor stuff. Like, and they're just out in the open with yeah. them. Like, you guys don't say this it's cool to you, you know, yeah. like to get you in trouble. Speaking of that, so my where I'm at in terms of the development of like what I'm going through with Ethan being in junior high and all this kind of stuff, it's like he wants to get into more dangerous things mm -hmm. and to uh, you know, kind of explore other ways to have fun fun with his friends and all this kind of stuff. And he's like totally over banned. He's like, Oh man, it's just a bunch of nerds in here. Dad. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, but it's the apple doesn't fall far. Cool, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I tried to tell him, like I regretted giving up piano when I did, like, I wish I would have kept it up. But at the same time, I thought the same thing. I was like, this is so nerdy and not like what I want to be doing. Uh, tell him his uncle Sal's a nerd. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe he'll feel better about yeah, it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> or maybe he'll be like, no. <laughs> I'm not going to be that intrigued. Him a little yeah. bit. So he's like really into airsoft right now. Like that's oh, the next yeah. thing. Because he used to play, you know, Nerf battles all the time outside. Like he's always just been into this whole, you know, shoot guns outside in the woods. And I'm like, you know, that's just boy energy. That's super fun. Yeah, yeah. and it's fun. It's like, so... I'm like, okay, these are way more realistic. Uh, the only like difference really of a lot of these guns these days are a little bit of an orange tip at yeah. the end. That's it. Yep. They literally look exactly the way they weigh the same, yep. you know, it's like, it's the real deal. And so, uh, I mean, it all sparked cause I, I got one for my Halloween costume, you know, cause I wanted it to be like authentic looking, <laughs> you know? Spent a thousand dollars on a yeah. on airsoft exactly. gun. So your costume's it was authentic. Airsoft gun. It was like, <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, this is sick. And um, of course, that. Ed, the first thing, like his eyes get like this big. He's like, dad, let me try this. And he goes outside and like pops off some rounds of these airsoft. And he got like so pumped. Now he's trying to literally call. He called every friend he knew. And he's like, we have to like create uh, like a place where we can all play capture flag and do all stuff out in the woods. And, and so I was like, okay, this could actually be pretty cool. But inevitably he runs into some parents that are like, you just mentioned the word gun and like, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to tell him how your son was selling it though to the kids, to the yeah. parents. Okay. So like he's selling it like the way the commercials sell it to the kids. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> real, <laughs> real, realistic. Oh <laughs> yeah. 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 He's yeah. just like military grade. You know, yeah. I'm like, you don't he's say that to the parents. Words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you don't say it. So we had to have a conversation. I'm like, this is how you need to skills. sell it. I'm like, this is an extension of Nerf gun <laughs> battles, right? Yeah. Like this is like the next level of that. Like, like you call them airsoft guns. Like, yeah. You don't call them like regular. Like yeah, you take this Tech Nine and then <laughs> oh my god, like, oh no my god, dude, yeah. Like no wonder they're freaking out. Like so, we had to have this conversation. <laughs> then it was so funny because he was like, "Okay, I want to do a good job with this with parents." Like there's two of them that are gonna be a real challenge for me because they've already basically said, "Well, guns, no, 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 no." And I'm like, uh, "Okay, so let's start with the easy ones." And then work our way out. So he started kind of like, you know, building up this presentation of how he's going to pitch it to oh, them. That's awesome. And he did it in front of me and Courtney. And we're like, kind of coach him through it. Like, oh, don't say that word, you know, and say it. So it turned out that we were like sitting through this and I was laughing because it was a lot like Step Brothers where they're like doing the whole uh, 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 prestige worldwide, worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like, I just imagine like, you know, the music and everything going with his like presentation. He, he actually had one of his friends create a slideshow. Prestige worldwide. Why? 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 Oh uh, my God. Showing Nerf guns and then this and that. And then the evolution. He showed, you know, more like the less threatening looking airsoft guns that were painted. <coughs> and, you know, so it was, it was quite the. Uh, no, I, you, guys, you, know, you know, it was actually even funnier. Justin was telling me that I thought it was interesting because he's been uh, off air. We've talked about this, about the transition that is his oldest is going through now where he's starting to want to separate himself from his younger brother. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he's like, the age the, difference. Makes yeah. It, yeah. But the, the, the funny thing that I found hella funny that's ironic about this, this story he's telling right now is that. His his oldest Ethan's having had such a hard time getting enough kids that can play. So now he wants to bring his brother. <laughs> so now his brother gets to so play. So and so I'm like, I, okay. so he has a dummy to shoot. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's talk about this because you know they're all gonna gang up on. Of him. course, like, dude. That's what happened to me. I was younger, bro. And I was like the shooting dummy for like paintball. Uh -huh. I remember that. And like they just turned on me and like, uh, so I was like, we can't. Okay, I'll have to referee some of these. Make sure your brother. Is have you like, seen the videos of these attacked? Because airsoft for adults gets crazy. Have you seen it? They wear like full tactical gear. Uh huh. There's this guy on YouTube that he's a dick, and what he does, he got a sniper <coughs> airsoft, and he's talking into the camera. And he, you're not supposed to do like neck shots and face shots. Yeah, yeah. 
but he talks in the camera. He's like in the bushes, and you're like, psh, and psh, hit someone in the face <laughs> to look around. And he does all these videos. It's hilarious. But yeah. It's kind of messed up. <coughs> it is the messed up. Speaking of school and stuff, okay. Just when you think things can't get any crazier and weirder. Did you guys see the teacher? Oh my god! I the saw math that. teacher with the prosthetic breast. You guys? No, was it a math teacher? Bro? It was a it was a um, science wood shop. Oh, wood shop. Wood shop teacher. Sorry. Did you see that? Yes. Okay. So this is a. I guess they're a transgender <laughs> uh, wood shop teacher. No, it's not even a transgender. He just came to school one day and decided that he identifies. I thought they were tra no. It just he can't. Well, it couldn't have been one day because those things were huge, bro. No, no, no he can't. He, he one day decided saying, like, going forward that like he was gonna do that. So one problem. day, so he, now he's saying, "I'm this is me. Yes, this is my identity." Okay, yeah, these yeah. are massive, massive cartoon heavy hangers, big nipple boobs, like yeah. through the like, sweater. Doesn't even wear a bra. They're just like boop. And then, okay, and he and he teaches a class this way, and it's not a joke. He's teaching. They're all they're very sexualized fake boobs. They're not real. They're they're prosthetic. And then the school defended him. Yeah. Wow. That's the, what the, the crazy hell? part is not that he did it. The crazy part is that the school didn't do anything about if it. If you're a female we're teacher. We're not going to think at all about his motivation of doing that. Like nobody's going to put their mind there. Did you know if you're a female teacher and you wear too low cut of a dress, they'll make you go home. Exactly. The dress code. But this dude shows up in these with these huge puppies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see Have the you pictures. Seen it? I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. Big old nipples poking out and he's teaching a class. You Dude, imagine I thought he was going to end up sawing one of them. He got all close. They're so big. And the school defended him. What the fuck world are we in right now? That doesn't make any sense. Does that mean a teacher could go in with a big fake penis, just big old bowls for their pants when you're down here? Yeah. Like, we still identify now. Yeah. I bet you. Well, why yeah, why, why couldn't not? you? If you can do that, why can't you do that? This where, is, this, yeah. Just, where, where, where do we draw the line in terms of standards and all that? It's just like, it's all over the place. It's insanity. And it just, you know what it highlights? This what, is, was it Texas? Was it Texas? Te it was Texas. I think right? so. It was, it was Texas. Texas. Interesting. I I know you would think that would be like in our backyard here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, what this highlights is the 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 weakness in human reason. Okay, so reason is wonderful, but the problem with human reason is we can reason anything into existence and make it sound like it's okay. Yeah. And this is one of those things. So the reasoning that they're doing is, well, it's his identification or her identification. It's part of who she is. We want to be inclusive. No, 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 no. The, the, the They're wearing big-ass fake titties to school <laughs> In front of children, yeah. obviously, there's at the very least, it's distracting. At the most, it's extremely inappropriate. Well, I think this also highlights the the way we've structured school systems too. Is just to me, that's what I mean. It should be a, uh, it should be a competitive system. Uh, teachers should not be a, a protected like they are for you know. Once they get tenured, now they're like almost untouchable. It's like almost impossible to fire a teacher. Like it should be built as a competitive environment. It really should be. So you get the the best of the best teachers and let the market decide. You know, let that teacher show up with his crazy gi ginormous boobs yeah. and then the school because of it starts suffering attendance. And then let it let it be to where they go, listen, we're going to find someone better for this position because unfortunately our attendance is suffering because you want to do this. Go do it somewhere else. The Maybe. irony is if there was actually a woman with boobs like that, which wouldn't exist. I think they're the I mean, I don't know if that that could even exist. That's how comically massive they are. So they're not like normal. It's kind of like dog. Well, I don't if, if a woman actually <laughs> had that, she would probably try to cover and feel kind of like, oh, self conscious about it or whatever. Well, yeah. This is to me, okay, it's my opinion, obvious, an obvious attempt at look at me, check up, check me out. And I'm, and these are, these are sexualized boobs. They're not just normal boobs. They're like, I mean, again, if you're watching YouTube, we got the picture up. Yeah. You can see what they look like. It uh, doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Meanwhile, you're trying to make a cutting board for your mom for Christmas, you know? <laughs> stupid. <laughs> so, hey, well, speaking, weird, speaking of cutting, I'll transition this out of visuals. this, job. Speaking of cutting, you've been cutting caffeine for the last, what, week uh, now? How's that uh, going So this will be week number, I think we're into like week, week one and a half. So I'm like one and a half weeks into cutting caffeine. And how's that going? It's hard, dude. It is. Bro, Harder I this time than last time or what? Because it wasn't that long ago when you did before, right? It's always hard. You know, it makes me appreciate just how powerful of a drug caffeine is. Um, and also makes me appreciate that caffeine uh, has positive effects and can also have just as bad negative effects. And I was starting to feel some of the negative effects. One of which is I got my caffeine intake because slowly, here's what happens. It slowly ramps up, right? You need more, you need more, you need more because your body adapts. And I started to get these crazy energy crashes in the afternoon with a high dose of caffeine. And I noticed that while my caffeine gets too high, 
I'll get a boost of energy and then I crash so hard that I literally can't even keep my eyes open when I'm driving, when I'm going home. And I start to get other effects too, like stress responses and just, I don't feel good. And if I add even more caffeine, I don't even get energy at that point. I just fall asleep. So I'm like, okay, it started to hit like the 400 milligram mark per day. So what I did is I started scaling it down. And usually what I'll do is try to go cold turkey and just be an insufferable asshole for the next you know week or whatever. But Jessica's like, just cut it down by 25 or 50 milligrams. Hold it at that place until you mm. feel normal and then keep bringing it down. So I said, all right, you're right. By the way, the motivation for this is one, the caffeine was getting too high. And two, I want to be off caffeine completely when the baby comes in November. Because so I want to have that. actually feel it again. Yeah, I want to yeah. have that because I know I'm going to- That'd be gonna my be only some, motivation. Yes. Be like, so I'm, I'm down to it. like 150 to 200 milligrams a day. And I'm, uh, or off. So are you, over, are you using anything to supplement? The red juice. I'm drinking the shit out of the red juice. Okay. Organifi's red juice. Like two a day or is that what you're Yeah, so I'll have doing? one later in the afternoon or sometimes I'll have two. One in the early afternoon, one later afternoon. I notice a big difference when I utilize It's that. not like caffeine. No, no. But it, it takes the edge off. It mitigates off. The, 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 cra the bad feeling yes. that I was getting when I was coming off of it. Yes. Like that. You know what's interesting is like, there's a really good study there to be had and nobody's going to fund it and do it. And nobody, and nobody has, and nobody will. But I bet you there's like, because what you're you're talking to, you're sharing something that I know for sure a lot of people have experienced, yeah. especially for someone who's aware. There is definitely this milligram threshold before the the adverse effects. Right now, totally. most of the studies are all the support, all the the cognitive benefits, the energy yes. benefits. It's all positive, 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 positive. But nobody talks about okay, all these great things. I've been taking it, taking it, taking it, and then I went from you know 100 milligrams, 200, 400, 600. Yeah. Now, because I have the exact same thing and i've i have nailed it down to for me it's literally if i do like a a coffee and then two energy drinks or say an energy drink and a pre-workout that's when the adverse effects start happening yeah. that's when the third you know pre-workout or energy drink or whatever it is that i'm having i feel it and then like feels like less than an hour later i feel tired Lethargic. like i'm yawning yeah, yeah. Ugh, like big yawns in the afternoon and then i it's always and that is my reminder like i got to go the other direction uh and and come back down again so but nobody has done anything on that nobody is is talking about that we always do it in these yeah. in these short windows to show all the positive benefits but i know that i've talked to enough people that are self aware that have used caffeine like this and everybody kind of says the same thing is that after a certain point I actually start to feel adverse. Caffeine effect. is yeah. a legit drug. If it got discovered today, it would be banned. That's a fact. It's mm -hmm. just present. It's been present in human civilization forever. Um, it's very powerful, very addictive. Your body develops adaptation, yeah. adapts just normalized to it. it. The withdrawal to caffeine is nasty. Okay. Anybody who, look, you get migraines, tired, irritability, depressed. Those are all normal mm -hmm. withdrawal symptoms from caffeine. Luckily, it doesn't last typically longer than a week or so. And the LD50 on caffeine is relatively low. LD50 is the amount of caffeine or the amount of whatever it is that they're using this to rank that would take to kill half the people. Caffeine is relatively low. And a lot of people don't know this, but it's one of the number one, aside from the you know heart, heart attacks and that kind of stuff, it's one of the number one reasons why people go to, to emergency rooms is caffeine overdose. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Caffeine overdoses are relatively common to where people go to the emergency room. So are they that high? Is it really that high? Very high. I didn't know that. I knew very a lot high. of kids, uh, like especially, like get into trouble because they start having <laughs> access to energy drinks and all, it becomes like somewhat competitive. They'll play video games yeah. and they'll try yep. to stay up all night, and it's a real big problem when they overdose on caffeine. Yeah. And the one, the beauty of caffeine is if you have the the discipline and the awareness to be like, Ugh, it's too high. Bring it down. And the strategy that I'm using right now is I go, I'm going down 25 to 50 milligrams. Um, that's for me, right? So I'll go, I'll cut it down to 25 to 50. And then I'll wait until that feels okay. Mm. And then I'll cut it down again and then again. And the goal is to get down to zero. And I notice the lower I get and I adjust, the better the low dose feels. So oh, right yeah. now, 200 milligrams or 150 milligrams is energizing. I feel good. I have a great workout. Whereas a week and a half ago, 200 milligrams was like, that was enough just to keep me being able to speak English yeah. because I got used to 400 milligrams. Yeah, I noticed it's like, it, it, it for me, it's like a snowball effect of uh, poor, awful sleep, like, you know, maybe one or two nights in a row. And then the, the amount goes up substantially yeah. to try and like make up for due. And then it's that kind of sticks around too long. And then, you know, really for me, besides red, I haven't gone the red juice route, I need to 
to to to to mess with that, but it was really just like I gotta really increase my water intake in between cups. Oh, that makes a big and difference that, too. That definitely made a difference. I'm glad you said me. that. And salt too. Yeah, a little sodium too. All right, so I want to address something that has been brought up about uh, one of the brands that we work with, and it's been brought up on other brands. And stuff <laughs> yeah, that you do about my rant on the Facebook. Yeah, yeah dude. People. <laughs> so so we we're working with um, Creatures of Habit, and they have a, 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 a oatmeal that's got 30 grams of protein and vitamin D and omega threes in it, and so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we put this out and we love it and we're promoting it. And we're thinking about investing in it. And Adam asked people in our forum, hey, try this out. Let us know what you think of the taste because we're thinking about investing in this company. Which, by the way, I've never done. Never Seven done years that. we've done this podcast. Never asked so. people yeah. to do yeah, that yeah, for yeah. us. And inevitably, someone's in there saying, oh, it's too expensive. You could buy oatmeal at the store for blah, blah, blah or whatever. We do this with Magic Spoon. So Magic Spoon is a great one, a great example because it's cereal that's high in protein. So it's, you get, you know, 25, 30, 35 grams of protein for a serving. And it's people not, are like, yeah, it's not Fruit Loops. Yeah, and they're like, oh, I could buy a box of cereal for a third of the price or whatever. It's like, okay, two things. One, we never promote the cheapest products on Mind Pump. We don't care about the cheapest products. You can find the cheapest products anywhere and easy. We care about the best quality. And two, if you're going to do comparisons, go apples to apples, not apples to oranges. When you eat a bowl of Magic Spoon, you're getting, you know, 25, 35 grams of high quality whey protein in that. Protein's expensive. It ain't cheap. Carbs are cheap. I can make carb whatever I want and yep. charge nothing for it. So, no, I it's I I mean I went on a little rant and I listed off all of our brands. Right, I went through Ned's and the Vioris and the Organifi's and the Magic Spoon, and I'm like, every brand Legion, every brand I listed, I can show you a brand that is significantly cheaper than this. I don't know what gave anybody the impression that we were going to build this business around introducing the cheapest brands that are out there that was never our intention in fact we weren't even going to advertise for other brands for the long time until we said you know what yeah i would like to introduce our audience to the brands that we love that right. we find that we spend money on that we like and and, and introduce it and to our audience deals so we did try yeah. and reduce some so price, i just i just well, think look, it's so funny when yeah. people get all weird like that it's just like okay, look, okay well then go go do that all really matters yes yeah. we advocate for whole foods always and we always say this if you can get everything through whole foods that is the best However, if you're going to supplement, if you're going to add a cereal, then we want to make sure it's a, it's best quality. And Magic Spoon hits the nail on the head. It's super good quality. It's grain free. The protein is high quality. It tastes really good. So you get that benefit because if someone's going to eat cereal, they want it to taste good as well. Otherwise, why? why Listen, I used to, I don't know if you guys ever did this. I did this for years. So if you want to do it, go do it. I used to make my own protein oatmeal. I used to put whey protein in cere regular cereal because I wanted, if I was going to have a bowl of cereal. So I like to, protein milk? Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to have 25, 30 grams of protein. So I used to do that myself. It did not taste near <laughs> as good as Magic Spoon. Yeah, at, I highly doubt that. Yeah, at all. And it wasn't that much uh, cheaper to do it that way. You still got to pay for the protein powder. You're still buying the box yeah. of cereal. It's like, I would much rather pay a little bit more for a formulation that is already done for me and tastes amazing and has all different kinds of flavors for me. And the same thing goes for the oatmeal. I used to, that is the re what made me connect to Mike when we he showed me, shared the oatmeal with me. It's like, oh my God, I used to make a very sim similar my concoction myself. But you know, I mean, he's got... The you, the omegas in there. He's got the vitamin D in there. He's got the seeds in there. He's got the the uh, the plant the plant protein in there. I mean, you know what, what a pain in the ass it is to bring all that stuff out every single morning. Yeah. Where now I can rip it, drop it in, and like, <laughs> and you're gonna charge me what a a dollar something more or whatever that than doing it myself. It's so yeah, so I funny know. to me when people get all weird and the like market's that. spoken by the way. Magic Spoon is crushing. <laughs> yes, crushing. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. like one of the fastest Speaks for itself. It's gonna. It's one of the fastest growing companies. Yeah, uh, and I think he's. I think Critches of Habit is gonna do the same thing. I really I do. I think it's. It, I think it tastes phenomenal and it's a, it's convenient and it's, yes. it's delicious yes. solid 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 product for sure so i just you know i i didn't see very many people respond to that rant because it's it's the truth like i don't think we're ever going to try and bring a product that we think is the cheapest one out there and if that's what you're if you're looking for the cheapest everything i mean this is what amazon's so great for hey look if you want to save money whole food Stick with Whole Foods. That's the best. Yeah. Always. Alibaba. And there's many that's ways you could go. save money with, yeah, you buy your supplements on Alibaba. Yeah. And that's, then, that's probably the yeah. cheapest you'll ha get. Have some lead with your, your fat burner. Isn't there a bunch, isn't <laughs> yeah. there a controversy going on around Alibaba right now? I thought I heard something on the news. Is there more? That, I mean, still the I guy. remember the, the, uh, the founder, right? Like kind of disappeared for a while. 
And uh, did, they, did he ever come? Did he resurface ever? Kind of came back and oh, because China put some pressure on him. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yep. Yeah. 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 It was all apologetic and all that. There's a new documentary out. You guys should watch. You know, uh, it, and it's a German company called. Did you see this, Doug? I know you're you normally catch shows. I like. It's on Netflix. It's called uh, Scandal. And it's the wire, um, wire card. Hmm, not familiar. With yeah, that. look, look it up for me real quick. Netflix wire card, I believe. Scandal wire card. If you search that, it should pop up. Um, crazy story. I had no idea about. Company's been around for over a decade, and it's a it's a fintech company that they in Germany they were so proud of because it rivaled the Facebooks and the Googles as far as its valuation. I think it was a, a couple hundred billion dollars. It's like a PayPal, you were saying. Exactly. Okay. It's so totally like a PayPal. Uh, same thing, basically digital currency. Now, what it later, like uh, over a decade later, what got, yeah, that's it right there, Doug. Wirecard. Is that what I said? Did I call no, it right? Yeah, yeah. Wirecard. Yeah, yeah Wirecard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really fascinating story. And it, and what they were doing is they were, I don't want to ruin the show for people. They'll watch the show. It's got, it's a, it's a really good, documentary on this but a massive massive over a hundred billion dollar company that everybody was rooting for for a long time it was making its way to the u.s when a lot of this stuff got serviced and wow. it just happened a couple of years ago i think i think it came out i think the allegations came out in 2019 something like that wow it says until i find a a tenacious team of journalists exposed massive fraud oh yeah. wow. very interesting whoops what's up everybody okay look there's this product that we work with called z biotics and this product helps you, or at least allows you to drink alcohol. So we're all health conscious here, but we like the occasional drink. And, but alcohol can cause some serious problems. Well, here's what Z-Biotics does. You drink this before you drink alcohol, and it's a genetically modified probiotic drink that breaks down acetaldehyde in the gut. So acetaldehyde can build up in the stomach, get to your bloodstream, and this is where it wreaks, wreaks havoc. Well, Z-Biotics gets in your gut, these little bacteria that have been engineered, to break down acetaldehyde, help prevent that from happening. Now, this is not an herb or vitamin supplement that you could take for you know hangover remedies or whatever. It's not like that. This is legit breaks down acetaldehyde. This is the real deal, and it's patented. So this is real science, ladies and gentlemen. This product really works. Go try it out. Head over to zbiotics.com. That's Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump22 for 10% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is Huevos Revuletos. How can I feel more activation of my chest rather than my shoulders when bench pressing? Ah, uh, yes. You know, they've done studies on this where people will think about a muscle while they're doing an exercise and they'll actually show more activation. So just trying to focus on the chest more during a bench press can definitely help. But there are some things you can do with your technique. Concentrate that make a difference. One of them is to flare the elbows out a little bit more. Okay, now you want to be careful with two flared of elbows. If you don't have the mobility and the control, that can sometimes cause problems. But flare the elbows more. And when you grab the bar, imagine you're trying to pull your hands together on the bar. Now, actually, do it, but actually, you create inside force or force dragging the hands together mm -hmm. while you grip the bar tightly as you bench and slow down. You're going to have to go much lighter this way but you will feel more chest activation because the act the action of the chest is to pull the upper arm in towards the center of the body. So that's what you're trying to do is trying to create tension in that direction. Well, and also the setup, right, is real important yes. in terms of like you having protracted shoulders and versus being nice and retracted and set. So that, that force is, right. you know, distributed properly and you're open and, and activated with your chest. But you do have to do some work there in terms of the connectivity first. So I would... I would then sort of regress and, and try to get like more chest activity and be able to connect there and maybe prime ahead of time by, you know, using some, you know, rubber bands or doing it in a way uh, where you could be a little more isolated and focus on the chest and the squeeze and then go into the lift. So I want to stress what you just said, Justin. I lifted uh, chest yesterday. So yesterday I did uh, incline barbell press and I went into it cold. I did a, a couple like light, real, real light, like the bars, slow down the movement. I actually did a little bit of an isometric hold even to kind of get in there. Did actually some in the isometric position, kind of squeezing the bar just to kind of thinking that I'd be able to just go into it and get going. Threw 135 on the bar, first set already felt my left shoulder 
clicking and felt it in my shoulder too much. It set the bar down, grab the bands, and had so even for somebody like me who's been lifting for over two decades, uh, completely understands the way my technique needs to be in order to use my chest. Great, great mind muscle connection, I would think. Right, still. I have to go prime my body and set it up to make sure I can yeah. activate my chest really well. So I can't stress enough how important that is first. And then it makes the advice that Sal gave that much better because even if, yeah, you, if you don't have basic good form, forget it. No, yeah. I mean, I, and you, I got good form. Like I, you know what I'm saying? That's, uh, that's how important just the habits. You that's know? just it. Because the most of the day we sit like this yeah. and even with me getting it, I get under there. I even had this routine where I, grab the two bars and I retract and depress and I get all in that position and I want to squeeze my shoulder blades down and I get in there. And if I haven't done a good job of really priming my shoulders and then priming my upper back for that position, it just doesn't feel that stable. And I end up feeling more in the shoulder than I actually do really. In my, and I feel my chest still working and I could just work through it, but I can feel my shoulders really getting involved way more. They just don't feel stable. So going in and priming my shoulders really well, priming my upper back to where I can hold it more more comfortably in that kind of retracted, depressed position, and then taking the tips that you're saying, Sal. Yeah, to, with a little elbow slightly, yeah. flare, like flare them out, and then gr grip the bar tight and drive the hands in as you go down and up. Mm -hmm. That should get that. But you're right, 100%. I was assuming they had uh, scapular retract retraction. You need to have that first so you can get the chest to really activate properly. Next question is from Mike. What are good mobility practices for tight hamstrings for someone who drives for a living? Now, oh. isn't uh, isn't tight hamstrings uh, way less common than, than people think? And it's more often than not weak hamstrings that are making people think that they're tight hamstrings? Well, okay. So you have to ask yourself. about hip flexors too. But you have to ask yourself what makes a muscle tight. Is it the muscle? Or is it the central nervous system, right? So mm -hmm. we tend to think of a tight muscle and we compare it to like a piece of rubber. And we think, oh, if a piece of rubber is cold or- It's not malleable. Or then, if it's not yeah. malleable, then it doesn't stretch for it. It doesn't work that way. Your mm -hmm. muscles your muscles are always warm. They're always alive, right? So they got blood flow. They're connected. So unless it's got removed from your body or you have a blood clot or something terrible, the muscle's there and it's just as malleable in that sense as other muscles. The difference is- your central nervous system keeps it within a particular range of motion. Why does it do that? Protection. It, yes, it does so because it doesn't feel strong or stable outside of that range of motion. So this is why sometimes bodybuilders get really tight. Bodybuilders can get really tight when they train in short ranges of motion because they build a lot of strength in those short ranges of motion. And then the body doesn't feel comfortable moving outside of that. So the person moves mm -hmm. and does things very tightly because all the strength is in that particular range of motion. And outside of that, now you lose a lot of strength. And that's just how strength works. If I build strength, if I do a half press, I get some carryover outside of that. But the further away I move from that range of motion, the less of the strength that I gain gets crossed over. So my body just keeps it tight to keep me stable. So your hamstrings are tight because they're weak. Mm -hmm. They're weak. They don't feel strong. So does this mean you go work your hamstrings? Yes, but also it's not just work your hamstrings. Also work them and work on good full ranges of motion yeah. and work on improving that range of motion. Yeah. Yes. So that that's the key. And I've actually was going running through this with one of the athletes I've been working with uh, because it's just, oh, my hamstrings and they're so tight. And, and uh, you know, one of the trainers was trying to just, you know, apply the old static stretching and just thinking it's like, we need to get them loose. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is like a an instability we're yeah. dealing with here. This yeah. is a lack of strength. And, uh, you know, trying to to then coach them on, look, you know, it you're going to still need to strength train. You're going to need to do it with appropriate uh, load and intensity. So you're lighting the intensity of it because each step of that, in terms of like regaining access to, to mm -hmm. that range of motion is going to require different strength uh, that you, you have a deficit in. And so now to be able to, you know, gradually progressively overload that and, and get you to respond properly, it's going to take some work. So yeah. I, I love Romanian deadlifts for this yes. and slowly progress the weight as you challenge range I would start of motion. With no weight. Yeah, right. Really. Yeah. You could literally just do, and that would be the mobility or the kind of priming, mm -hmm. right? Is you just doing it just body weight to get yourself in that position. But I mean, I think you could l very lightly load the bar safely mm -hmm. 
and and take it to the end range of motion so to where it feels mm-hmm. uh, as comfortable and then try and challenge that range getting in, in a little bit more a little bit more every every few so weeks. i did this i had a client once that um was a truck driver and this was an issue mm-hmm. and we did we started with because they were so tight that loading just felt inappropriate so we started with uh body weight good mornings and i think i don't know what they're called where you have your hands behind your head yeah it's like prisoner uh, yeah so or prisoner, and all we uh, did is i as i Focused on hip hinging, right? Yeah. So Waiter keeping bows. Yeah. yeah, keeping really, really good kind of neutral spine, leading with the chest, couldn't go down very far. And as soon as his back started rounding, okay, that's not, we're not going to go any further. Don't we have waiter bows in Prime or one of our programs? We do. Yeah, yeah right? we do. Prime Pro, in, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. And, and performance. And right. I had them, I had them do them. And each rep, I had them challenge that range of motion without breaking form. And we would actually add a good four inches, five inches of range of motion within the workout. Then as he started getting stronger and it got easier and easier, then we would do a little bit of load. Yeah. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to build strength and tell your CNS, it's okay, it's safe. We can move into these new ranges of motion. Static stretching will increase range of motion, but it's nothing to increase strength. Or I should say very little to increase strength, so, so little to nothing. So if you just tell your CNS, ah, relax, and you do this by holding a long static stretch, you actually can put yourself in a bad position because... Your body's tight for a reason, and if you get it to move outside of that, and then you go do something that requires any type of strength at all, you see risk of injury go up. And this is why there was that that you know paramount study, and I don't remember when it was done. I want to say the late '90s, early 2000s, where they found that static stretching before athletics increased injury. injury. That's yep. exactly why. Next question is from Jason Miller, 56. Is there a difference in training cardio for cardiovascular health versus training to increase VO2 max? What's the best way to train for overall cardiovascular health? Yes, there is, but there's a lot of crossover. It's like a Venn diagram. So in the middle is health, and on one end is just health, or one of them is health, one of them is uh, performance, and in the middle is like longevity health, right? If you push VO2 max at some point, you start to sacrifice health for VO2 max. So in the beginning, any kind of cardio increases your VO2 max. Right. You take a, somebody who doesn't do cardio, you get them on an elliptical, they're going to get a boost in VO2 max. But at some point when you're trying to push VO2 max and you're trying to really push performance, this is true for strength, by the way. This is true for any physical uh, endeavor. Once you go past a certain point, you start to trade longevity and health for performance. So like you look at top power lifters. Yeah. They're not as healthy as someone who does strength training just for health, right? But at some point when they started, they were just getting health benefits, but then they passed that to go for extreme strength. Same thing with VO2 max. If you look at like the top, top, top VO2 max, you know, athletes, like top marathon runners or super distance runners, they don't have the best longevity because they're pushing their bodies too hard. But in the beginning of training, you get both. So now that I've said that, what's the difference between the two? Cardiovascular health, you want to train consistently and you want to maintain a decent cardiovascular system. So at some point, you're not trying to push your, your, your times. You're not trying to go crazy with your performance. You're just doing it for enjoyment. You're doing it for consistency and you're doing it to feel good. So I would say that's the big difference. Well, it really depends on what your desired outcome is. Like, what are you trying to gain from it? Because how you're, what you're trying to gain from your cardiovascular training would dictate how I would have you do it right i mean it's almost like asking the same thing like what is uh what's the best way to uh, to lift weights yeah it's like well i mean it depends it depends on it's a pretty general broad uh topic yeah, yeah. what's it like or be more specific like they said what's the best way to lift weights for health what's the best way for cardio for health well i mean there's a lot of health benefits to different types of cardio modalities I well mean, it's just it there's a lot of different versions like it's not just you know running and jogging and everything you know straight ahead like yeah. you can do all kinds of cardiovascular training in multiple planes and explosively and you know there's just a, but that requires a completely different skill set that you need to acquire and totally learn. do you do you want to have increased uh, endurance and stamina do you want to be able to uh, run for an hour straight and be okay doing that do you want to have more explosive uh, uh cardiovascular endurance, where something in, in shorter durations but you can push higher which would be like vo2 max stuff like so it really depends on uh, and each have their benefits it's nice to have a little blend of both but i mean it, it's tough to answer a question like that and then it also depends on where you're where you're currently at and what you're trying to achieve outside of that as far as building muscle and things like that because you could tell me that 
Um, Adam, I want to be good at you know cardiovascular endurance. I want to be able to run for an hour or two hours. But then you also go, and I'm really trying to build 15 to 20 pounds of muscle right now. I was like, okay, well, those are very challenging to do at the same time. Um, maybe we focus on one more than the other. And so th this is a bit of a depends question uh, for the, the person that's, that's asking. Yeah, well, that all being said, I'll make a general, uh, I guess, piece of advice around this, or, or, or I'll give a general answer I think is true for most people. If you look at the whole context of the thing, so longevity, and you factor in risk of injury, you factor in the technical skill involved, right? Because running is a highly technical type of movement that most of us can no longer do well because we stop running when we're 12. Mm. Um, so if you factor all of that in uh, an availability and consistency, like the likelihood someone's going to stay consistent, the likelihood that they'll have access to this particular type of movement as they get older, if you factor all of that in, then walking has to be the, the, the winner. Mm -hmm. because it's still something we can all do. We're not in Wally world yet. I'm sure we'll get there soon, but for now, everybody could still walk. It's very accessible to people. You just walk. You can go outside and walk. You can walk on a treadmill. You can walk anywhere. So it doesn't require lots of stuff. The risk of injury is low as a result. And for longevity, I mean, daily walking, if you're walking a decent amount every single day, you're going to reap tremendous health benefits over time. Now, you're not going to be a phenomenal runner or athlete by doing this. But if it's just for health, with all those things that I said, it's hard to beat walking. It really is. Next question is from Ferm Labouche. When did you all know it was time to go all in with Mind Pump? Oh, <laughs> man. I lost this one. Yeah. What do you mean? I lost this one. Oh, no, you tried to go Do you not remember? I do. Yeah. 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 Adam definitely tried to incentivize us to jump in earlier, I think, than mm -hmm. we were ready for. But Well, he was in – and I understand why. He saw the writing on the wall. He's very good at reading uh, business signals. But also, you know, we all had kids – yeah. And those responsibilities. And so it places a different price. Wanted our own individual businesses at the time that yeah. we were all. Yeah. yeah. I wanted on. us all a little scared. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I really did. I really, I wanted us all to be. A, a it's really scary when you have kids to support. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Which is why I lost. Right. That's how yeah. that was actually the, if I had a kid at the time and I still want to, I might've won that argument. Cause I've been like, I'm in the same boat as you yeah. motherfuckers. Or right? would you have made that decision? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah, probably still. I'm still just as crazy, I think. Uh, it wasn't crazy, though. You, you were pretty logical about it. It wasn't like you were just like, let's just do this. It, it wasn't yeah. really nilly or anything. Yeah. It was yeah, like we, were already, we were already producing uh, good, rev decent revenue. Um, we weren't taking from the business yet. So what people have to know is that, so for the first, uh, for first year, we didn't monetize anything. By year two, we started to monetize, and we were we had our normal businesses and jobs this whole time. That's right, and we were yeah. Everyone was making their their livelihood elsewhere than Mind Pump, but Mind Pump was starting to generate revenue, even though we weren't taking any of the proceeds yet for ourselves. Um, but it was getting to a point where it was pretty consistent every month, not enough for any. And, and this is where I wanted to go. It wasn't enough for anybody to quit their jobs, and it was an it would replace the income they were all making elsewhere. But that's what I was trying. I was trying to seize that moment was I didn't want us to wait till everybody was making the same kind of money they were making doing other things. I wanted us to be a little a little hungry, hungrier, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, now, so in hindsight, do you think we do? You, I mean, obviously, everything worked out well. But do you think we waited too long? Or I do you think I think I do. I still think it's part of our Achilles heel. Mm. I do. I, I think we're if hungry um, enough. Yeah, I just think that, um, and I'm I'm just as guilty, right? So this isn't me like oh, I told you, guy. It's like all I feel like sometimes um, because we because this was a passion project, because we had security and other things that um, we we sometimes lack urgency in this business. In fact, off air before this podcast started, the four of us literally all in agreement. This is something we need to do for the business. We all agree it's important. It's important. It's important. But because we're not starving or we don't like if we don't do it right now we're we're all fine financially we kind of drag our feet a lot and i feel like had we had that switch a little bit because i've i've seen it in us right there was a time right before covid hit um we got a little nervous yeah we did we we all got a little like it just that was the most nervous i've seen us in seven Justin years was turning tricks on the street but we we, we, we had a little we, we got a little nervous and um it was really neat to see uh just how dangerous the the four of us could be if we were starving so i'm gonna give you because i i i 
I, I agree, but I also want to give a little pushback just for sake of conversation because I, I respect tremendously what you have to say about uh, about this particular thing. I, I think it's not it's uh, you definitely have a genius when it comes to business. But I'll push back a little bit, and here's my here's the counter. The counter is going to be that what it allowed us to do by waiting a little longer was by never say. compromising yeah. our integrity mm -hmm. because we had a lot of offers for deals and money and sell this product and push this way, this particular thing this way or sell it this particular way. That's true. But because we weren't backed into a corner, we could give them the finger and say, no, we're going to do it our way. And let me tell you. We didn't have to have it. We didn't have to. And I like being in a position where I don't have to because then what I can do, because I'll tell you something right now, as much as I, as much integrity as I have, if it's between integrity and my family's survival, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know if I'll compromise my integrity or not. I'm not saying I would, but I've never been in a position where I feel scared for, oh crap, or my kid's going to have to move, or we're going to have to take them out of their school, or we're going to whatever. I'll concede to that. Yeah. You know? I'll concede to that. I, I I don't disagree with that statement at all. I think that's a very fair evaluation, and I don't even know myself. I'd like to believe that we would still, you know, sacrifice. But I I think that's a very fair point because it did give us that luxury of no, we're not. I mean, we. Uh, we had the zero fucks attitude. We, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't monetize for a year. And then when we actually started to monetize the programs, we didn't take advertising for another year after that. When we could have, yeah, mm -hmm. we could have taken advertising a year earlier than what we did, and we didn't because we wanted to wait. I, I mean, we priced the programs the way we did based off integrity, where we could have like you know wheeled and dealed. We didn't do subscription model. Thankfully, looking back, that would have not worked out so well. It would have been a nightmare. There's a lot of things we turned down. A lot of sponsors. We didn't um, do a lot of the the tricks that people do on social media and with mm -hmm. media in general to get attention, just to get a, a few eyes. Um, and it put us in a pretty strong position. But I 100% get what you're saying because I know that when you're in, when your back's up against the wall, um, we all have another gear. Yeah, I know that. I know that for a fact. So, and I, I and here's how I look it's at it. It's hard to like, yeah, like manufacture that. Just uh, it is when you're fat and happy, right? Like yeah. when things are going well and. Uh, to but you always considering that like there's gonna be dark days like there's always gonna be something to consider and to to try to uh, uh, generate that without uh, any kind of real yeah. conflict or or something that's like pushing you uh, it's difficult it's a difficult thing to 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 create amongst us yeah. but I now, think it's possible now the irony of all this is this is the best success all of us have ever had. Yeah. And we've all done lots of businesses. Yeah. We've all had definitely. our backs against the wall in, yep. in, in that position. So it's easy for me to look back and be like, we did everything right because of where we're at. But I get I get what you're saying. I know that. I know if we're if we're in a position where we're like, it's it's swim or die, you know, we're all gonna find a way to swim. What yeah. are your thoughts, Doug? I mean, I, I feel like we did it the right way, personally. Um honestly you I, already stress enough, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, my back to this wall. <laughs> it already feels like a stress cadet already. <laughs> and my cortisol is already pegged to like, the uh, upper level. More. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just feel like uh, I mean I'm capable of pushing you know through things and, and making things happen when I have to. But I, I mean I don't need to add more stress to my life, honestly. Yeah. And uh, I think I think we did do it the right way. I tell you yeah. what, though, had we, I mean, again, this maybe maybe this goes in favor of my argument. If all of us did this before we had kids and you know mortgages and we were supporting you know, our I families, have a feeling it would look a lot different. I don't know. I think it would. I think we would have, like, in terms of like the overall vibe. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, I know we would have so been can, animals. Can you can you take? So I agree, but that also that would rewind us back to our early twenties, right? Yeah. So it, that it, to me, it's less to do with the kids, less to do with the family, more to do with being a bunch of twenty five year olds. Because if you gave yeah. our 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 maturity and wisdom that we all have where we're at in our lives now, yeah, and you, and we were, I, I think we would have been fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we would have been fine. I think that that's the part that matters even more was that we've seen a lot more mm -hmm. in our in in our lifetime, and Doug especially, right, because he's almost lived two lifetimes, has yeah. seen so much more that you we. I think that wisdom, Old if wisdom. we could bring that back to twenty five, it would be better. You know, I, and I think with the the question, right? So the question is, when did we know? So you want it to happen. Faster. I knew early. I knew or I yeah. knew actually and so Let's I mean, how thing, soon how much sooner? I think I think you even knew early. I mean, I think we I think we knew as soon as the podcast started to I take off. As soon as Craig, you know, before left. money was even involved, I think. Oh, I knew. knew. I knew I knew this was gonna go well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone said it and felt it very early on. And so how much sooner did you 
push it and before we actually did all quit our jobs? Almost a year. Was it a year before? Almost a year. Almost a year. Okay. Long. Yeah, I think I think we waited almost a year longer than I would have yeah. uh, would have liked us to. For me, I was in a weird position because um, I'm very conservative when it comes to investments, but I'm when it comes to business, I'm very risky. I, I, I'll take a chance if I believe in it. But I was in a weird position because I had just gotten divorced, uh, left the house to the ex so that my kids didn't have to move. And remember, I was sleeping on my, I stayed with you. Then I uh -huh. slept on my brother's couch. And then I had a tiny little apartment and I, had, and I had just sold my studio. And so I was just training people to make ends meet. Yeah. yeah. And my biggest fear was my kids had been going to this, uh, the school that they really liked. My biggest fear was having to pull them out because my whole goal during that period was I don't want to shake my kid's world any more than I have to because their dad and their mom are getting divorced. Mm -hmm. So that kept me more like, so for me, I had to, I, I, when I felt like, okay, I can, I can, I can stop training people and not have to pull my kids out of school or do anything like that. That's when I felt like when I felt that kind of safety, but that did make me wait longer than I think I would have. Otherwise. Yeah. Cause you were the last person to cut all clients off. Weren't you? Because even after we kind of went all in, we still, I know we all still had a, a couple clients, but I yeah. think you had the roster the longest. I did um, online a little bit for a while, but I did that m not so much for the money. It was more to, because you had worked with online clients and you had gotten a lot of um, insight mm -hmm. into training online. And because that was such a developing field, I had no experience. Yeah. So I did it more for the insight, yeah. uh, you know, what was going on, um, but yeah, by the time yeah. you were doing online, because online came after you cut your clients. Yeah. You were already fine financially. Yes, I know yes. you didn't need to do it financially. Yes. I think you did it more. I think the but the clients in person, I'm you still- I remember when I did that. I don't remember. Yeah, it was I uh, know I did kind of similar. Like I yeah. yeah, I started to to kind of farm out a lot of my clients to other trainers I knew um mm -hmm. that I trusted. And then that was like and that was a big struggle, mainly between the conversations I'd have with Courtney, because she's the solid um, you know, was, was a nurse and, and I was grounded in the fact that we had like insurance and, yes. you know, all that. So that was like my anchor. But then it was like, at a point she was miserable in her job. And I'm like, she, I know she wants to, to transition out of this and to stay home. And I'm like, now I'm like, Oh no, well, I'm actually just, you know, ditching this completely and starting <laughs> this whole new thing. And she was like, I don't know about that. Like I've done this to her multiple times in our marriage. It took a while before Courtney was even sold. The business was hella successful. Yeah. And she still wasn't even sold on it. You know why? <laughs> I remember that. He's a again, serial entrepreneur. She's to, married to a serial that's entrepreneur. That's it. I'm, yeah, it's, I've done this in the past so many times and, and she sees how the patterns go. <laughs> hey, you, know, and, hey, you uh, gotta swing the bat, baby. You I know? swing, man. That's yeah. just it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult because it, 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 it put a lot of stress on our marriage and everything. But to that point as well about us having maturity coming into this, yeah. um, we reinvested a lot of our money. And so it was like, if we made money, we kept putting That's it true. back in. We took and a so tiny she never really salary. saw that in our bank account. Yeah, so yeah. her whole thought of like how much money we we're making was only what's in our bank account. I'm like, no, no, babe, we got it in here. And then we got over here. And, uh, <laughs> it's like, pfft. She's like, I don't care. I don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still driving a That's Corolla. She knew. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you know what? You brought you you talked about clients going to you know what was hard for me that I that I dreaded was telling people that I trained for 10 years, 12 years, 13 years that I wasn't gonna train them. I, I remember know. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I still struggle with that because it still hurts oh. me to, to, to yeah. talk about it because I had developed I'm terrible following up. Too. Oh, I had ter I know I had I had developed such relationships with these people. Some of them it was their entire fitness career like it was how they started fitness yeah and i'm and i'm telling them i'm gonna you know have them train with someone else it's like you know you can't replace that relationship and i just I, you know look at the look on their face and they all told me i knew this was coming because they yeah. knew about mind pump and they're like happy stuff. for you but they're also like oh like they were super bummed out oh man. broke it was my a hard heart. conversation it I broke had. my heart to do it that was one of the hardest things to do so for trainers to do that man I, I feel it i think part of the reason why we were able to make it work is because there's uh, without like putting ourselves i think if i was by myself i would have had to force myself in the corner mm. yeah but because we had each other to lean on and strengths of other guys to yeah. be able to lean on i felt like that's also part of why it still worked out. Like I feel there's, at least for me, I feel like if there's no way, if I had something that I saw like, oh, there's opportunity here, I I yeah. can make this happen and I'm not jumping all over it right away. Actually, that's go. fair. If I was by myself, I probably would have jumped faster because mm -hmm. I don't know how I would have done it yeah, any there's, other way. Yeah. I think the advice I would give to a younger entrepreneur is if you don't have, as I tell people this all the time, especially in the NCI coaching group, if you don't have 
a lot of responsibilities and I, I mean real responsibilities. So don't get offended, but look, if you, unless you're, you're, you're taking care of your family, okay. you're invincible. I was yeah. before I had all this. I don't if give a, a shit. Like a parrot you have to feed. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you count. I, 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 like, I know that like, I know that I could end up on the streets and I'll be fine the next day by myself. But when my kids depend on me, my wife, you know, if you have parents that depend on that kind of stuff, but if you're that, if you're that free where you don't, you're don't have, you're not married. You don't have kids. You don't have anybody to worry. That's the time to take the biggest risk. Go for well, it. Well, the reason why, because it, it, okay, we talk all the time about how, you know, motivation is bullshit. Self-belief is everything, yeah. right? And that if you rely on motivation to get yourself in shape and stuff like that, you're, you're eventually going to fall out of shape. And it's totally. not, if that, the same thing goes for being successful in business. When are we highly motivated? When it's a new idea yeah. and it's fresh and you're just getting started. So when the motivation eventually wears off, it's really hard for the average person to get up every day, still grind those hours in, unless it is literally the only way you fucking eat. If you, it is do or die. That's right. Uh, you there, you got the built-in motivation yeah. every day. This is why I like that. This is why yeah. I like putting myself in that situation yeah. because then I'm not counting the hours all day. I'm you counting my next meal. Out. How yeah. am I going to eat next? I'm not stopping work until I've figured that out. Like, where if you have that luxury and you have that cushion and you do it, then you're, 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 you rely on it to be exciting all the time. And this is on, this is the only business, which, so all the other ones I've ever built, the very beginning, there's a honeymoon stage mm -hmm. and it's amazing and it's fun and you're trying to figure things out. And then you prove to yourself, you figured it out. Then you make a little bit of money doing it. Now you're making a nice little living off of it. And then it's like, wah, wah, wah. Boring, this yeah. is the first one that we I have ever done that is seven years deep and I'm arguably as excited more to come to work or more yeah. every day the only today. time it's ever happened and that's like the first thing like again to the point of being the serial entrepreneur yep. different it's the interest level it just yeah. goes away because you like, like building stuff I love building stuff we're not done building yeah this. there's yeah. a lot of there's exactly lot. there's much more to go yeah but I'm just happy that I don't know man back against the wall back then you know we might have ended up with a, a line of fat burning <laughs> or something like that. I mean, you, know I mean? you bring up you bring up a really good point that it's i i said i'll concede to that you because you're because products. here's the thing you said maybe you would i'll be straight up if it came down to feeding my son or giving me food i'll steal that's just if it, if it yeah. was do or that's do or die like uh, I'd, i'll risk going to jail yeah uh to make sure my kid lives and my wife that. is fed i get that like yeah. that's to me yeah, I, I that's just that's that's a hundred percent i i know that i'm that person and so you're right uh by doing so i never had to question that i there was never a point where it's like we were in a great position man we could tell people to f off all day long and we did we told we, a we lot of people that, yeah to f off in those early fun. years now i mean we still do we still tell a lot of we don't say it like that though <laughs> <laughs> we're much we're nicer now. We're a little nicer. We now. had a little bit of a chip on the early days, right? <laughs> anyway, look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal, and they're all free. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Mind Pump Justin on Instagram. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam on Instagram. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.